Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. Uh, my name is Matthew McLarnon, and I'm, the one, I'm one of the marketing managers at Angos Software, and I'll be your host. Uh, welcome to our webinar on Scorecard Best Practices and Visualization. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. Uh, before we dig in, I just want to run down what we'll be going over in the next 30 minutes. I'm going to take a quick moment to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Mamdu Rafat. Uh, Dr. Rafat will then take us through a brief introduction or refresher on scorecards. Uh, applying the CRISP methodology for scorecard development, followed by best practices around the development process. Uh, we will then dive into what visualization, monitoring, and controlling means for scorecards. Dr. Rafat will then take us through some lessons learned. I'll take things over quickly to outline the tools used to achieve what we saw here today. I'll let you know about some available scorecard resources, resources and then we'll take some questions. Dr. Mamdu Rafat is Angos Software's Chief Data Scientist. He is a recognized predictive analytics expert and published author with over 20 years of experience and has worked with Fortune 500 companies around the world. With his experience in high demand, I can tell you that Dr. Rafat's schedule is quite full, so it is a real treat to have him with us. Thank you, Dr. Rafat, for taking the time to join us today. The floor is yours. Thanks, Matt. Hello, everyone. Um, so today we are talking about uh, uh, credit scorecards. So there are two types of credit scorecards what's known as application scorecards and behavior scorecards. Application scorecards, as the name imply, are uh, developed to estimate the credit of good or bad or intermediate of new applications to a credit product, whether that product is a credit card, a loan, uh, or any other uh, goods or services provided on credit. So uh, the things we estimate for application scorecards are whether or not to accept the customer in the form of estimating whether this application or this account would end up being good or bad. And the second thing is uh, the amount of credit we offer uh, to that application, the credit limit, and of course the price of the loan, the interest rate if we are applying variable uh, interest rates. Uh, the second type of uh, behavior scorecards is what is known as behavior scorecards. Scor behavior scorecards uh, are built and developed in the case where we already accepted certain clients and they already have some uh, a credit product and they are doing transactions. So what we are trying to predict is whether they will continue being good customers paying on time or they are going to become delinquent and in default. Uh, there is a, a second application of behavior scorecards in the case of collections where we have already determined uh, that all the customers in that uh, collections book have been in late payment. They are in default already, usually more than uh, 90 days or 120 days. And then we start determining which one of these customers uh, will actually pay back or not. So that's uh, another application of behavior scorecards. The main difference between application scorecards and behavior scorecards is the availability of the data. At the time of application, we have limited amount of data because the, the, I, the data I can use in scoring new customers are only the data I collect at the time of application. In the case of behavior scorecards, I have additional data coming from the behavior of these customers and their transactions, their purchases, their payment types, their payment schedules, and so on. Um, so why do we build scorecards? Um, uh, we build scorecards in the standard format. This is the, what is known as a scorecard standard format. It's a simple tabular format where each characteristic or each predictor is segmented into categories or bins. For example, the age on this simple table is segmented to different bins, and each bin gets a, a number of points. And then the total score is just summation of all uh, these points. This simple uh, format has a lot of attractive features in it. Number one, it's transparent to the consumer who's applying and getting the, score, the, the credit product itself. So they can go there and understand why they uh, got the score they got. So this is the first thing. The second thing is very easy to deploy in IT systems because it's a simple if-then-else uh, rules, set of rules. And then the last thing is uh, because of its simplicity, it's also defensible in uh, legal, uh, when it comes to legal uh, 
problems because in most industrial countries, uh, the customer has the right to know uh, the justification for the credit decision that was made of, uh, as a result of their application or their behavior. Uh, so this slide, we next move to the area where we talk about how we build scorecards. Uh, there are many methodologies, or the methodologies uh, encapsulate more or less the systematic steps that the analyst takes to build a scorecard. Uh, one of the, the common methodologies is what is known as the CRISP-DM methodology for building data mining models, and we adapted it to building scorecards, basically uh, the collection of the logical steps of building a model, understand the business, understand the data, prepare the data, build the models validated or evaluated and deployed. And it's not going in a linear fashion from left to right. It's actually uh, an iterative process of continuously understanding the data, defining the business problem, uh, preparing the data, exploring it, and modeling it, and so on. So it's an iterative process with many connections as needed. Uh, there are a couple of additional steps in the case of building scorecards added to the standard CRISP methodology, and that is the binning of continuous variables and building weight of evidence transformations. Uh, uh, so uh, these special steps are very specific to uh, building scorecards in order to be able to end up representing the scorecard in the standard tabular format. Uh, the next slide we talk about briefly about data preparation. Data preparation and data exploration are actually the most two important steps in building any model, including scorecards. Uh, when we talk about data preparation, meaning I'm going to collect data from different sources, operational sources, external bureau uh, scores, uh, all the application data, all the behavior data in case of behavior scorecards. And then uh, the most three important steps is number one, cleaning the data from inconsistencies, for example, outliers or wrong values or wrong interpreted values. Uh, the second thing is creating uh, the dependent variable or the default indicator based on a definition of default. In most cases, we usually use 90 days default or 60 days default meaning the customer was late more than 60 days or 90 days beyond the uh, due date. And then the third important factor or step in building uh, in, in the data preparation process is the creation of uh, the weight of evidence transformations, and that requires the redu reduction of the cardinality of nominal and, categorical and, and, and continuous variables. So the output of the data preparation, it was known as the mining view or a development view, where we have the dependent variable, in most cases good or bad. Sometimes we allow good and bad and intermediate, but it's easier to deal with only with good and bad. And then uh, each record represents one customer, and all the characteristics of that customer or that account are in the form of columns, rolled up in the form of columns uh, for that uh, record. Integrated with the step of data preparation, we do what is known as EDA, exploratory data analysis, also known as data profiling. We want to understand the data and understand what transformations should I do on the data to improve the predictiveness of the variables I have. This is the whole purpose of it. I want to make sure that I don't have any errors or inconsistencies or outliers that would shift or distort the behavior of the scorecard and in the same time prepare the data to extract the maximum predictiveness out of it. So the EDA together with the data preparation can sometimes uh, make take most of the time, like up to 80% maybe sometimes, of the entire uh, project time. Uh, one of the steps uh, of, the data of the data profiling or EDA or one of the features in it is that as much as possible I should use visualization in order to be able to see quickly the patterns. Of course, I use a lot of statistics and cross tabulations and uh, one-way uh, uh, frequency tables and correlation analysis and so on, but visualization usually helps me a lot. The use of different charts, simple pie charts or 
uh, uh, histograms or just line charts using showing frequency distributions usually relieve, uh, re reveal a lot of uh, the hidden patterns within the data that will help me quickly uh, find problems in the data and uh, imp increase the predictive power of the variables I have. Then the next step, which is very special to the building of uh, credit scorecards in the tabular format, is the weight of evidence transformations. The weight of evidence transformation is a very speci special format, uh, very special mathematical transformations that I apply it to bind continuous variables and on grouped categorical variables or nominal variables. So, and in that case, I achieve several things. The first thing is that all variables now will be represented as numbers. The outcome of weight of evidence uh, transformations is a numeric value. And the second thing is uh, that numeric value represents the odds of bad to good or good to bad. It's up to me to set it up. We usually make it the, good, the bad to good, the odds of the account going in default. So that if I have one variable only in the model and I build the logistic regression model using only that variable after transforming it in the form of weight of evidence, the parameter of that logistic regression will be exactly one. This is one of the best way to check quickly whether I did the weight of evidence transformations correctly or not. Uh, a second feature, second desirable feature of the weight of evidence transformation, on the screen here we see uh, two distributions uh, the curve in the blue uh, represents the weight of evidence for that variable. And some of the continuous variables, the weight of evidence distribution is not monotonic. Monotonic means it's going only in one direction, either increasing, continuously increasing, or continuously decreasing. In this case, it goes up and then goes down a little bit. That will result in a scorecard points for that variable, for the different points, increasing and then decreasing again. And that may not be uh, considered a consistent use of that variable. Therefore, one of the good ways of building scorecards or good practices of building a scorecard is to make sure that the weight of evidence uh, transformations, especially for continuous variables, are all mon monotonic, like what we see here on the right-hand side. And software tools that apply optimization methods are especially useful in that case. Uh, the next step in the process is to actually build the model. Scorecards today are usually built using logistic regression that will lead to this standard tabular format. And logistic regression plays a central role in the development of scorecards because, as I said, there is a very uh, a generic or uh, important relationship between logistic regression and weight of evidence transformations. While we are building uh, logistic regression models, we usually start with uh, more variables, more predictors than we actually need in the model. So we start with a large number of variables and we can either apply some of the methods to select the most predictive variables from them before I build the logistic regression or I let logistic regression filter these variables and find uh, the most predictive variables. One of the most commonly used methods in that during the building the logistic regression model is a stepwise selection of the variables. While I am doing that, I can also specify what kind of level of confidence uh, I apply, or known as a p-value, when I select these variables that go in and out of the model. And uh, some of the uh, uh, best practices tell us that if I'm building a model just to explore what, is, what should be in that model and what should not, usually we use a p-value of 0.15. If I'm building a model that will explain the behavior of certain variables, I use a p-value of 0.1. And then if I want to build a model to actually do some predictions, then I have to be more strict with the confidence uh, uh, level and I have to have a p-value of 0.05. And while uh, 
uh, logistic regression using stepwise selection is automatically finding the best set of variables in the model, I can sometimes force specific variables or certain variables to be in the model, even if they are not as predictive as the other variables. A good example for that, if I'm building a behavior scorecard, and if all the variables that ended up from the stepwise selection are only behavior variables, for example, transactions, uh, uh, average balances, and so on, I should actually add some uh, application variables because new customers who start uh, behaving or start transacting in my product and they don't have any history, enough history of transactions, will have no uh, values in these behavior variables. So they will get no score. So the best way to, to force uh, the, the scorecard to be general to all kinds of customers, whether they are uh, new customers or old customers, is to use variables that have legitimate values for all the customers. And these variables are usually uh, related to the application process. Then once I build the model, I have to actually make sure that the model is tested against the validation data set and sometimes called holdout sample and maybe also tested against another third sample. Uh, test data set. And while I'm doing that, I am doing that using statistics and also using evaluation uh, curves. The most commonly used curves are four curves, the lift chart, the cognitive lift chart, the KS chart, and the ROC chart. The importance of the ROC chart or the receiver operating characteristics uh, chart is that the area under that curve is the best estimate for the C statistic. And uh, it's the most uh, objective measure known today, one of the very uh, well uh, uh, documented to be objective in uh, evaluating the power of the model. And there is always, there is, again, there is a, an industry value, accepted value, 0.75 for behavior scorecards. So if, my, if I'm building a behavior scorecard and I don't get a C statistic of 0.75, I have to ask myself whether I have done all the steps and obtained all the data that I can get uh, or not, because below that it's considered a weak model for uh, behavior scorecards. Uh, the next step after that is to scale uh, the logistic regression model into the tabular format that we have seen before, and then come up with some decisions. First of all, I end up with points, for example, uh, where I have uh, the base points is 500 and uh, at an odds of good to bad of, let's say, 1 to 50, and the points to double the odds is 20 points. And then what? After that, I have to decide when do I set up the limits for acceptance and rejection, and in between, I will ask for, for more documents, or do I have a more complex way or a more elaborate uh, strategy of deploying the scorecard. One of the best ways uh, to come up with a good strategy of applying scorecards or deploying them, not only have simple cutoffs, but also have cutoffs and ranges, and also integrate into that key performance indicators. For example, even when a customer gets a low score, uh, but if this customer is going to be profitable or this customer is going to be loyal, so it's going to be high risk but high return, so maybe I accept them with special condition, for example, lower credit limit. So I have to take into account in the deployment strategy more than just the score. I have to take other key performance indicators, and one of the most useful tools in that it was, is what is known as a strategy tree, which we have an image of it on the right-hand side. Once I have built the scorecard and came up with a good way of deploying it in the form of a strategy, then usually uh, we use a lot of visualization in the form of task dashboards and a lot of uh, charts in order to explain the behavior of that scorecard to other consumers of the score. For example, here we have a variety of uh, examples of visualization. For example, the top bar chart or histogram represents the distribution of the scorecard points in the different ranges. Uh, the bubble charts represent uh, the, some categorical variables where the, each bubble color represents a category, and the size of the 
of the bubble itself represents either the average score points or another variable within uh, the, the data set. At the bottom, some uh, distribution of uh, uh, bar charts or histograms for some variables. Some of the good visualization tools, like for example Tableau and other tools within our software, is that when you focus on one of the categories or one of the ranges, for example, this dashboard now is the same as the previous dashboard, but I focused only on one range of the scorecard points. I'm looking only at all the customers who get about 600 points, then these are the distributions of the other variables for them. And that will help actually uh, the marketing people and those who are deploying, the business users who are deploying these scorecards to understand uh, the characteristics of customers, for example, in this case of high score points. Those who get a high score of 600, what, are, what is different uh, in them uh, uh, from those who get a low score points? And in that case, they can design the strategy a bit better by defining better key performance indicators and uh, come up with the right actions to uh, deploy these scorecards. Once I have the scorecard and I put it in action in deployment, then I have uh, to monitor and control its behavior. So the, more, the, the objective of monitoring and reporting on it is number one, to evaluate the effectiveness of the scorecard in action on actual customers while it's being deployed. And the second thing is, uh, so uh, I originally, for example, had a behavior scorecard to make sure that I capture all the customers who are in risk of delinquency before they actually uh, 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 go into delinquency. So I want to know that, and once I predict that they will go into delinquency, I do something about it. I negotiate the terms, I give them different pricing, I ask for more collateral, and so on. And then the second thing is to make sure that the scorecard doesn't get old. In the sense, is it necessary to rebuild it because the population changed? Uh, controlling and monitoring scorecards because it involves a lot of reports is a very time-consuming task uh, for us analysts and requires implementations uh, on a continuous basis to calculate frequencies, tables from different data sets and so on. And uh, it's, it's vital to keep doing the, the monitoring and controlling of scorecards because the population is changing. Why is the population is changing? Because the nature of the customers is changing. I'm losing some customers as a result of churn or delinquency or cancellation. And I am also getting new customers as a result of marketing campaigns and uh, acquisition of new customers, mergers, and so on. And of course, uh, the competition, the movement from the competition. They are changing the behavior of the customers. They are also sharing some of the customers with me, and they are changing the behavior of the customer. So I don't expect uh, the same characteristic of the population to stay the same because I build a scorecard on a certain data set that was extracted from a population at a certain time instance, then uh, that population keeps changing. So what are the tools we have for monitoring and controlling scorecards? Uh, there are very uh, many uh, um, simple charts, for example, the distribution of the score points and so on, but there are a couple of uh, special reports and indices used specially for scorecards. The first one is what is known as a stability report. The stability report con compares the distribution of score points at two different time instances, at the time of building the scorecard and after deploying it, let's say, for example, after two months, three months, or six months, and so on. And as a result of that report comes an index, and that index is actually a statistic, and we can, imp we can interpret this statistic because uh, if that statistic is between 0 and 0.1 or 10%, it usually means that there is no significant change that happened to the population and the resulting scores. If it's a bit higher than that, between 0.1 and 0.25, that means there is some change and some challenge in the change of the population. But uh, I have to investigate it, but I don't really need to rebuild the scorecard. If the population index is higher than 0.5, uh, 0.25, or 25%, that means there is a large change in the population 
that warrants uh, rebuilding the scorecard and examining the entire process from scratch. There is another report which looks at each characteristic on its own and monitors the shift in the points generated from that characteristic. For example, let's say uh, a certain age group, I assigned that the scorecard resulted in, let's say, 12 points, and after some time, I noticed that the proportion of the population who is getting these 12 points is increasing. So effectively, I am shifting the effect of these uh, 12 points on the entire population. So how do I, uh, I visualize and monitor the scorecards? Here is a dashboard uh, that one of our products can also generate these uh, charts. And in it, for example, we see here all uh, the charts that were used in the assessment of uh, the scorecard at the time of building it, like the ROC chart, uh, the lift chart, and then the resulting statistics, for example, the Gini statistic or the AUC statistic. Uh, the next dashboard, uh, we, folk, we zoom on it, we can see that I can see the cumulative lift chart and the ROC chart, so I can compare them between two time instances. Uh, the next dashboard showing me uh, the population stability index uh, and at different times, so over time, if the population stability index is below a certain value or higher than a certain value, remember we said when the population stability index is higher than 25% uh, or 0.25, that means I really have to rebuild the scorecard. And some of the uh, tools that we have, we can also set up some limits. So automatically I get warnings and I get uh, uh, alerts when these values increase. The same for uh, the population characteristics and the points assigned to them. Finally, the final report I'm going to show you is the detailed report uh, that some of our tools generate that I can compare the distribution of the points that come out from the scorecard automatically for different ranges. And all these ranges are customizable and I can uh, look at them, and this is the basis actually for calculating uh, the population stability rep uh, index. Um, so in conclusion, I just reviewed with you today the CRISP methodology and how we applied it to scorecards and went quickly through the best practices of building scorecards, and uh, we explored some of the tools and methods for monitoring and visualizing uh, the outcome of scorecards. I turn it to Matt now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fott, for uh, a lot of great information there. We're going to get to questions in just a minute, but before we do, I'd like to highlight a few items. Uh, we saw the output of Angos Knowledge Studio as Dr. Fott discussed the development process. Knowledge Studio has all the tools you need to build and deploy scorecards, including weight of evidence optimization and model evaluation. Our integration with Tableau gave us those two dashboard views. And it's our brand new knowledge manager tool that gives you the ability to, to easily monitor and control your scorecards, ensuring that they are constantly performing at 100%. If you're saying to yourself, this is great, but we just don't have the in-house knowledge of resources, we've got you covered there too with our professional services, training and consulting that can get you up and running. We have some resources lined up to help you with your scorecard journey. Uh, you can access them in the resource list in the console. Uh, the first is a three-part video series that takes you through the eight steps of developing a scorecard. And the second is our Build Better Scorecards Faster ebook that dives deeper into how scorecards and predictive analytics play together. For those ready to implement, we're just about to release a brand new white paper on creating scorecards with Knowledge Studio. Even if you aren't currently using Knowledge Studio, the first section of this paper still offers uh, some great insight, so I encourage you to take a look. Uh, attendees today will get to see it first, so keep an eye out for that in your inboxes. Uh, we're coming right up to the 30-minute mark, so um, I just have one question uh, that we're going to do. I've seen it come up a couple of times. Um, the ones that we didn't get to, uh, we will address directly. We'll get in touch and be able to answer your questions. So, uh, Dr. Rafat, can you tell me what optimization means for scorecards? Yeah, I mean, like, there are a couple of optimization we, we use within the scorecard. The first one is the optimization of the weight of evidence, and we can do that 
on two levels. One level is make sure that it's monotonic. The second uh, level to make sure that it doesn't have any null values, any pure segments. And the third thing is we can also optimize the outcome of scorecards by combining several scorecards using our optimization tool to build, for example, what is the best credit strategy for each customer? What loans do I give them? What credit limits do I give them? Uh, what is the pricing for them using mathematical optimization? Not only during the building of scorecards, but also at the deployment level. And that product is called Inside Optimizer. Excellent. Thank you. And as I said uh, to anybody, uh, we did have some questions we couldn't get to today, uh, so we will reach out directly and get those answered for you. Uh, I really hope I lived up to uh, the promise of an insightful 30 minutes. My thanks once again to Dr. Rafat, uh, as well as everybody who took the time to join us today. And if you're looking for any further information on scorecards or have any other questions, you can email us at info at angos.com or call us toll-free at 1-888-687-8838. Thank you again for your time and have a good day.